here and finish up um, what uh, we started here. And I like these next couple of slides because they are they're really kind of bare bones and, and, and real basic into understanding. And again, if you've, you've kind of seen the pattern here where we explain all the anatomy and then you know we discuss the receptors for each of these special senses and then we talk about how they undergo transduction, converting that stimulus energy into some sort of electrical energy, which is the action potential or nerve signal. Um, and then we're going to talk about the pathway. All right, so where, all right, that where, from where the stimulus occurs, you know, how we perceive that, or, or you know, your conscious, your, your conscious sensation, okay, and where that travels to the brain. So we're going to talk about that now. This slide's really good because it's really basic. It's the bare bones, okay? So it starts off here, all right, as light enters into your eye, okay, it's going to travel through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, then through the pupil, then pass through the lens, travel through the vitreous humor, and wind up in the retina, okay, in the neural layer. I'm going to come right back to the slide real fast, okay? So here's, the, here's a, a, a picture of the retina here, okay? We've got our two layers here. Okay, you've got the big thick layer here with the photoreceptors, the bipolar cells, the ganglion cells, and then a couple other cells in here. And that's the neural layer, has all the, the neural structures. Then you've got this thin layer here, the pigmented layer. Remember last class we were talking about, all right, that's where the outer segment of our photoreceptors, that are all these cells here, the rods and cones, all right, the outer segment all right, of the um, uh, rods and cones are embedded into the pigmented layer. Because remember we talked about the bleaching effect? When you get up in the middle of the night from a dark room, you go to the bathroom, you flip the light on, you're like, oh, I'm blinded, all right? That bleaching effect occurs inside the rod or cone, well, inside the rod specifically, okay? And what will happen is, all right, our, our, our light-absorbing molecule, rhodopsin, okay, it has to leave all right, the outer segment and go into the pigmented layer to be repaired, put back together, okay? If you're not really quite clear about what I'm talking about, review last, uh, I can say this, last week's uh, uh, um, uh, lecture, okay, on that. All right, so here are the two layers, the pigmented layer and then our neural layer, all right, that's made up of a couple of those different cells. All right, so after the photoreceptors are stimulated, all right, then the next layer are the bipolar cells and then finally the ganglion cells. And it's the ganglion cells that they will form because all the ganglion cells, their, their axons will co converge on the optic disc. Remember, there's no, there's no photoreceptors in the optic disc, okay, because that's where the nerves exit out the eye and the blood vessels enter and exit in and out of the eye, okay? So everything converges there, and that's where the ganglion cells are going to form the optic nerve. Optic nerve is cranial nerve what? Two. Just easy way to remember optic nerve. Two eyes. Yep. Two eyes and, and olfactory, one nose. You know, that's how I remembered it. Okay. So all right, those ganglion axons will all converge there, all right, at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. Okay. So here's my alpha picture. Here's the back side of the eye. So you have one optic nerve coming from the left eye, another optic nerve coming from the right eye. Okay. And then they kind of converge at this point. We've seen this before. All right, what we call the optic chiasm, okay? When we saw the optic chiasm, okay, because the pituitary gland sits right above it, okay? And so if you get a pituitary adenoma, it presses. This is the optic chiasm right here, okay? So you have axons that are going to come, and I'm not going to get into all the um, uh, fields of vision and all that, okay? That's beyond the scope of this uh, course. But you have axons that come from the lateral portion of the eye, and they'll stay lateral. Whoops, they'll stay ipsilateral, okay? All right. Wow, I have too much coffee. And then you've got the medial, all right, uh, axons that will actually cross over. All right, so they'll cross over. So you'll get some axons that'll stay ipsilateral, will stay on the same side, then some will cross over. All right, keep that in mind. All right, let me go back. And then after the optic chiasm, this portion here, that's called an optic tract, okay? And those optic tracts are gonna head back to the thalamus and a couple other places, but most of the axons that travel in the optic tract 
are going to go to the thalamus, but specifically the lateral geniculate nucleus. All right, because we're going to talk about the medial geniculate nucleus in one of the uh, future senses here in a moment. Okay, and then from there, all right, those axons and those optic tracts will travel back to the occipital lobe. All right, it'll head back to the visual cortex. Okay, we'll talk more about that in a moment because <clears throat> I've got an actual picture from your book that's way better than my horrible drawings. Okay. All right, so just to remind you, if you look at this picture here, all right, light travels in, all right, passes in through the pupil. It's going to hit the neural layer here, but it's going to pass through the ganglion cell layer. It's going to pass through the bipolar cell layer. Then it's going to get to the photoreceptor cell layer, all right, and then it's going to generate a nerve signal possibly, all right, but it's going to stimulate these photoreceptor cells. And then our actual electrical signal or the action potential will then travel out this way, okay? And then it'll exit out down along. I hate when that happens. It'll exit down out and head towards the optic disc, okay? So keep in mind, you know, way back when, when I first started learning this material, all right, um, when I was sitting when you were, I just assume that the photoreceptors were right there, all right? Uh, like when, when you have a doctor looking in your eye with the ophthalmoscope and they shine that light in, their, in your eye and they're peeking in there, all right? They're seeing this layer. They're seeing the actual ganglion cells axons. That's what they're seeing all right? Among, amongst blood vessels, all right? They can't see these deeper cells, all right? So when I was sitting there taking the class, when you were, I used to think the photoreceptors were right here. Okay, but the light would hit those first. It's not that way, okay? The photoreceptors get hit last because, all right, here's your, here's your iris, okay? And the light, or not the iris, the pupil. The light comes in, passes through the lens, passes through the vitreous humor, and then it just keeps traveling back this way, okay? <clears throat> all right. So our, our, our visual pathways here, there's a couple elements right, that I need to discuss with you when we're talking about these visual pathways. One all right, is the fact that we have binocular vision, meaning we have two eyes, right, and they each see their own separate image, okay? But they actually will then overlap those images, and when we do that, that's that stereoscopic vision that you get, and that's where you get depth perception, okay? So keep that in mind, right? So each eye, will see its own image, and it will overlap those images, all right, those visual fields there, all right? And when it does that, it, it provides us with that stereoscopic vision there, that depth perception, okay? So, when we're going through our visual pathways, all right, we have the optic nerve, then the two optic nerves converge at the optic chiasm, and then after the optic chiasm, we have our optic tracks, okay? Well, on our way, those optic tracks all right, are going to project axons to a couple areas here. We've seen the superior colliculi before. Remember those four bumps on the midbrain? All right, on the tectal plate, we have this, well, you should know this for lab, the superior colliculus of the corpora quadremina, that long, long structure there. All right, so if we're looking at the midbrain from the back, you'll see, all right, on the back portion of your midbrain, you'll see four bumps. Okay, the top two, that is the superior colliculi. And they're responsible for reflexive eye movements like watching, I've said this before, watching a tennis match. When the ball is volleyed back and forth, when your eyes are following that ball, okay, that is being governed by the superior colliculus there, okay? Another nuclei area, all right, in our midbrain is going to be the pretectal nuclei, okay? The pupillary reflex, this is the light reflex. Okay, so this area governs the light reflex. So when I shine a light in your eye and your pupil uh, constricts, okay, that has to do with the pretectal nuclei. And we've also talked about the accommodation reflex. That's also important for near vision. Okay, remember what the accommodation reflex is? All right, if you're looking at something far away and you glance down at your cell phone or your watch, all right, your eyes have to converge, but also what happens is your lens accommodates, meaning all right, the ciliary muscles, 
are going to contract. That causes those suspensory ligaments to relax, all right? And then your lens will then form a thicker shape. It's fat. Okay? That's called accommodation. Okay? So keep that in mind. The superior colliculi and the pretectal uh, uh, nuclei are going to be found along our visual pathway all right, as the optic tract is projecting back towards the thalamus. All right, it's going to send some axons off to the superior colliculi. And it's also going to send some axons off the pretectal nuclei. Okay, so you can have your pupillary reflex. All right, because the second part of the pupillary reflex, all right, you've got the sensory portion, which is your optic nerve. Okay, but the motor portion is going to be the ocular motor nerve, and that's going to control the sphincter pupillae muscle in your iris, which causes the, the, the constriction there. All right, let me zoom in on this guy. This is showing us our visual pathways, all right, with the binocular or stereoscopic vision, okay? Basically, this is just showing you, all right, you have each individual eye has its own visual field, but where they overlap here in this region, that's what allows us our depth perception, okay? Very, very helpful. That's why if you have monocular vision, only have one eye, you can't get a, a commercial driver's license. You can't operate a truck, all right, because you need that depth perception, all right, otherwise there's gonna be problems on the road, okay? That's uh, straight up. So just to kind of, let me, all right. So here you can see, here's the retina of the eye, okay? So the axons, all right, on the lateral portion, most of those on the optic nerve are gonna stay ipsilateral. So they'll come down, towards the um, optic chiasm. The medial axons, they cross over for both of these. The lateral axons stay ipsilateral, but we get a crossing, okay? So then, all right, after the optic chiasm, these are our optic tracks, okay? So the optic tracks give off, okay, some axons that are going to go to the pretectal nucleus and the superior colliculus, both located in the midbrain. All right, for visual reflexes, all right, but also for the pupillary reflex and the accommodation reflex, okay? But then the remaining uh, axons will continue on to the thalamus, and then they'll synapse in the thalamus, all right? And then from there, okay, they'll project back to, to the occipital cortex, or occipital lobe, to the visual cortex, all right? This, this is just basic. I didn't want to get uh, too involved in this. There's, Again, I don't go over the visual fields in here because on one, we don't have time, but it's kind of fun because we'll talk about what happens if you lesion this area here, what happens to your visual field, what happens if you lesion it here, lesion it here, or lesion it here. But again, we have more time. But if you take a, a, a neuroanatomy class, you might get a chance to do that. That part is fun. Not to say that what I'm teaching isn't fun. I think it's freaking awesome. All right. Any questions on vision? Okay. I think that you folks will like uh, hearing and equilibrium a little bit more. Vision is, is, is I, would, I would say out of the special senses is the hardest one, okay? Hearing I find fascinating just because I understand physics a little bit more, so it makes it a little bit easier for, to relate to. And equilibrium, same kind of thing, all right? If you understand hearing a little bit, you, you should understand equilibrium because there's some similar pa patterns and I'll talk about it. Okay, so the big hearing organ all right, when we're talking about the special sense of hearing is our cochlea, okay? The cochlea is found in the inner ear, okay? The inner ear also houses our vestibular complex, but we'll talk about that when we do equilibrium, okay? But both are in the area that we call the inner ear, the cochlea and the vestibular co uh, 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 complex. So we're gonna start off with the cochlea. Remember, that's that snail-shaped structure, okay? But essentially what it is is this is long tube. Okay, and there's three chambers in it, all right? And so we've divided, all right, you've got this one long chamber, kind of like in the middle, all right? Looks like that, okay? And right in here, I'm drawing the blue. And right, we'll talk about that in a moment, the membranous labyrinth versus the bony labyrinth, all right? Okay, so we've already seen that. So this one structure called the modelius, all right, that is, all right, we, we, we say that's the bony axis of the spiral, so I'll show you what I mean. I don't have a really good picture, 
All right, so here's our snail shell, right? And it's that long tube that we've kind of wrapped up. Right? But all we've done is the modelius is the center of that snail shell. And it's basically where the nerve fibers run into. Okay, I don't have a good picture to really show it to you because I'd like to show it to you from the bottom portion of the cochlea. But I don't have one, right? And I'm not gifted enough to draw, as you folks know. All right, but just know that the modulus is basically where those nerve cells all right, are going to enter in and kind of branch out and go to different areas all right, of the cochlear duct all right, in the vestibular, uh, the scale of vestibuli and the, and the, and the scale of tympani. Okay? So like I said in my awesome drawing in the beginning here, okay, we have this three-chamber structure. And this one I'm kind of drawing in the center here, all right, right here where I'm drawing this wavy line. All right, that's the cochlear duct, okay? So the top portion of the cochlear duct, all right, right there where I'm drawing that arrow to, that's the vestibular membrane. That forms the roof of the cochlear duct. Does this look familiar? Because we covered this in lab. All right, good. I just want to make sure, I want, I want to review this with you, okay? And then the bottom portion of the cochlear duct, okay, that's the basilar membrane. That forms the floor, okay? So then this white structure, up here, okay, that's the scale of vestibule, right? That's going to sit on top of the vestibular membrane. And then this white structure down here, all right, that's the scale of tympani. That's going to sit below the basilar membrane, the floor of the cochlear duct, okay? And where the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani connect to one another, this area here, right, that's called the heliocotrema. Okay, that's just where they connect. I'll show you another picture better than mine. Okay? So now that we kind of see the anatomy, because now what we're going to talk about, because up here is where the oval window is. Okay? So remember what I said. When the sound waves beat against the tympanic membrane, it vibrates the auditory ossicles, and then the, the, the foot plate of, this, uh, of the stapes beats against the oval window. That creates these pressure waves, and they'll just bounce around here, all right, in the scale of vestibule, and then eventually they'll stimulate, all right, well, not stimulate, but they'll irritate and displace, all right, the vestibular membrane, and it'll push pressure waves downwards which will then uh, stimulate the tectal plate and then the basilar member. We'll talk about that, okay? I'm jumping ahead of myself. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. So the specific sensory organ, all right, of our hearing apparatus, you guys remember the spiral organ, okay? It's this structure that sits right inside of the cochlear duct, all right? Pretty much it sits along the floor of the cochlear duct. It sits right on top of the basilar membrane there, okay? And in this structure, we have these hair cells, and we, we labeled those in lab uh, last week, I think, okay? And there's a couple rows of hair cells. We have one row of the inner hair cells, all right? And then we've got three rows of what we call the outer hair cells, all right? And inside these hair cells, again, I was going to attempt to draw them for you, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do this. Where are you? There we go. Much better. All right, so here's our single row, all right, of inner hair cells, and then we've got our outer hair cells, and we have three of them, okay? So they sit here within the spiral organ, and then you've got your supporting cells that are found nearby, okay? And then at the base of each of our, our um, hair cells here, we've got sensory neurons, okay? And then at top, at the top here, all right, We've got these stereocilli, okay? And then you've got this one tall uh, guy with a knob at the end that's called the kinocillum. I think I've got a picture here to show you. Hold on. Oh, I don't. Yeah, I do. Here we go. That's what I want to show you. I'll come back to those other slides here in a second. All right, here's our hair, our hair cell, okay? And then you can see we've got a bunch of stereocilli, and at the end we've got one tall guy. That's our kinocellum one, okay? And they're all attached here, okay, to a sensory neuron, okay? Good with that, guys, so far? And you can see these hair, these hair, um, excuse me, 
the hair cells, but mainly the stereocilia, they sit in this tectorial membrane, okay? So when anything moves the tectorial membrane, it's going to stimulate these hair cells, all right, or these stereocilia here. More on that in a second. All right, let me go back a couple slides here. Okay. So keep in mind, all right, for our hair cells, all right, you have two structures, the stereocilia, okay, which are just long microvilli, and then at the end, all right, which is associated with the hair cells, you have one special structure, all right, or one cilia, which is called the kinocilum, all right, it's got like a little knob at the top of it, okay? All right, quick review on this, oh, we already saw that slide. Just to kind of give you, this is our transverse cut through the cochlea here, all right? So here's the cochlear duct, all right? Inside the cochlear duct here, all right, this is the membranous labyrinth, remember that? Okay, the bony labyrinth is all out here, okay? And the bony labyrinth has these chambers within it, all right? In those chambers, you have perilymph, okay? The perilymph is right here. That's similar to interstitial fluid or extracellular fluid. Okay, stuff that's outside the cell. Okay, so that's in the scale of vestibuli and the scale of tympani. That's going to be, all right, our perilymph. Inside here, all right, the cochlear duct, we have endolymph. Endolymph is rich in, remember, from lab, maybe not, potassium. It's similar to the intracellular fluid. Okay, so it's high in potassium. Keep that in mind positively charged ion because if it enters into a cell it's going to depolarize the cell more on that in a moment okay so keep that in mind the endolymph has high amounts of potassium okay okay all right are you feeling pretty good about at least the makeup and what the spiral organ looks like okay inner cell row or inner cell <sighs> inner hair cell one single row, outer hair cells, three rows, but they all have the similar makeup of the stereocilli and the kinocilum on top, okay? And the spiral organ sits right here on the basilar membrane. And then above it were all these little stereocilli, all right, and the kinocilum, they're embedded into the tectorial membrane, okay? So if the tectorial membrane starts moving around, it's going to stimulate these stereocilli. All right, the basilar membrane moves all around. Okay, it'll push the it'll push the spiral organ up into the tectorial membrane. In some cases, it'll move down. Okay, but regardless, that's going to affect what's going to happen with those stereocilia, moving it up or down. Okay, it bounces around like being on a trampoline. Okay, all right. I really love this slide because it really. And then there's another slide in here um, that just hits it as to and it breaks down hearing into the most basic it's a, it's, a, it's more complicated than this but i really like this because it's been a lot of time i'm trying to put this together and i like to teach you know i tell folks all the time i'm the smartest dumb guy i know all right you know so if i can understand it i'd like to think that most other people can all right so i'm going to start the story off all right of how sound travels okay so it travels perfect example as i'm talking to you Okay, as my voice is projecting through the air, it's traveling. Remember, sound can travel through three mediums, all right? Air, liquid, solid, okay? So it's traveling, and air is the worst for it to travel through. It travels best through a solid, okay? To prove that, put your head on the desk and with your ear against the desk and start knocking on the desk. It travels wonderfully through that. So as I'm talking to you, sound waves are traveling through the air towards your external ear, the pina, okay, or the oracle. It's funneled in, travels through the external uh, um, ear to the tympanic membrane, beats against the tympanic membrane. The tympanic membrane starts to vibrate back and forth, causes the movement of the auditory ossicles. Great, that's awesome. Auditory ossicles are bone, that's a solid. So essentially their role is to amplify the sound. So they start to amplify the sound because we need to do that, okay? So as the sound waves travel through, all right, the auditory ossicles, they amplify the sound, and then they transmit the sound eventually through the foot plate of the stapes against the oval window. And it beats against the oval window, and it creates what we call pressure waves. And those pressure waves are going to travel 
through the scale of vestibule. Okay? And then they'll travel through, and depending on, we'll get into this, the frequency and amplitude, all right? They will travel and then start to push on the vestibular membrane, which is the roof of our cochlear duct. Okay? Going back. That's this guy. So they'll beat on the roof here, our vestibular membrane of our cochlear duct there. Okay? And so that will cause distortion and it'll start to slosh around the endolympin here. Okay? Just like when you're in a pool or whatever and you start pushing the water up against the side of the pool, it creates waves. That's what's happening here. All right? Those pressure waves are going to be moving the endolymph around. Okay? Clear that out. All right. Whoops. All right, and this all it's it's this is based on the sound wave frequency, okay? And this slide here, and I'll talk about it here in a moment. All right, this slide puts it in, in great terms about the sound wave frequency here, okay? It'll determine on what, what area of the basilar membrane or the vestibular main membrane it's going to actually interact with. But all right, so depending on it's like a guitar string, okay? If you ever played the guitar. All right, the neck, there's the neck of the guitar. That's the part that's up uh, at one end. And then you got the base of the, I think it's called the base of the guitar, the big fat portion of the guitar. Again, deal with me. It looks more like a banjo in my drawing, but that's fine. Then this skinny part of the guitar, that's called the neck. You got strings that go down. Okay. So the strings that are near the top are going to be tighter. So they'll make a more higher pitch noise. And the strings down here will be a little bit looser, all right? So they'll make more like a, a, a lower uh, pitched or more like a bass sound. Very similar, all right, with our basilar membrane, okay? So specific sound wave frequencies will uh, um, irritate or displace specific regions of the basilar membrane, okay, depending on what the pitch of the frequency is, all right? When that happens, when the basilar membrane gets irritated, because this is what's going to... So much of my brain I want to get out to you guys. All right. So the pressure waves transmit down here, all right, through the vestibular membrane. Okay. And it sloshes the endolymph around. All right. And then it's going to pass through, all right, the tectal membrane, the spiral organ, but it's going to then move the basilar membrane around. When that basilar membrane shifts up or down, okay, remember the hair cells are embedded into the tectorial membrane. So that's going to stimulate those hair cells. Okay. Okay. See on a picture here? Here's the tectorial membrane. All these hair cells, all right, and their kinocillum and stereocillum are embedded in here. So when the basilar membrane moves, moves down, all right, or up, all right, it's going to all right, create changes here in the stereocilli. Okay? And we'll talk about that in a second. All right, onwards. So as those hair cells are being stimulated, distorted, whatever you want to call it, all right, depending on the movement of the basilar membrane, it's going to influence the amount of neurotransmitter that gets released. Okay? Then, when that neurotransmitter gets released, all right, we'll fire off action potentials. When those action potentials will travel down the sensory neurons, all right, towards our vestibular cochlear nerves, all right? Cranial nerve eight, right? And then what will happen is that sound, those pressure waves as they transmit through the basilar membrane, right? They'll transmit through the basilar membrane down here into the scale of tympani, and then eventually they'll go out the, the scale of tympani, all right, back towards the round window. And you're probably like, what the heck is that? All right. Here you can see it a little bit better on this picture here. I know I'm jumping around. All right. So you can see the sound waves traveling here through the scale of vestibule. Depending on whatever the, you know, the frequency is, it travels down. It will first irritate, all right, the vestibular membrane, which is the roof of our cochlear duct. All right. Then it will travel down and irritate, you know, the, sp the, the spiral organ, but the basilar membrane here. And that pressure wave will then exit out and head back towards your inner ear, or excuse me, towards your middle ear. And this is the round window over here. 
Okay, so you got the oval window up here, the round window here. Okay, and obviously as it travels through, all right, a liquid, all right, it starts to get weaker and weaker, just like when you throw a rock into a pond. Eventually, you know, the energy just starts to disperse, and that's what happens here. It just gets as it travels, just becomes weaker and weaker and weaker, and then it gets absorbed here. If you really want to understand, all right, how sound is actually created, read this slide, okay? 16.27. This spells it out wonderfully. And I'll talk to you about that in one second here. Um, actually, let's talk about it now real quick. All right. So you can see here on our picture, all right, through the external ears, air as the sound waves are traveling through air, they keep a, a specific amplitude, okay? But when they hit the middle ear, they really get amplified because of the auditory ossicles, right? Then they'll hit the inner ear and then they'll start to, uh, um, start to lose a little bit of strength because it's gotta travel through liquid. So as again, as those uh, sound waves beat against, or uh, the ossicle beats against the oval window here, it creates these pressure waves. And that pressure wave will then start to travel through the scale of vestibuli. Now, closer here, all right, you'll see higher pitched noises, sounds. The further away from the oval window we get, all right, will be lower pitched. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's the that's the wave amplitude, the way that sound waves are generated. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So, the, so this it's amazing because this you got a whole length here, all right, for us to have audible sounds that we can perceive, all right. So as it enters in, now depending on where it stimulates, all right, the basilar membrane in our cochlear duct throughout this whole structure here will then give us that perception of whatever sound that we're hearing, okay? Um, oh, let me jump in here. Questions about that? I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit. I really do enjoy teaching this part of the special sensor. All right. So we got to quickly just talk about what happens to the actual hair cells, okay? These hair cells, all right, have a couple of special structures on them, all right? The inner hair cells specifically, all right, have these special type of ion channels at the tips, all right, mind you, at the very tips of those stereocilia there, okay? So we call them, all right, these special channels, a tip link. All right, that are there because of this protein. That's this guy. Okay, so here's the stereocilia. Okay, and at the end, you got these special proteins here. All right, and then you've got these structures that go in between. All right, from one stereocilia to the next. All right, these are these tip links here. Okay, so what will happen is now, mind you, this is all right tectorial membrane, okay? So these are all embedded here. So when that endolymph starts swinging around and influencing and pushing on that tectorial membrane, all right, that can open up, all right, these, these channels, okay? These specialized ion channels. This brings us back to what I was saying before. Endolymph is rich in potassium. Potassium is a cation. So if it opens up these channels, potassium will enter into our cell, making it more positive on the inside. And what do we call that process? What do we call it when we make the inside of a cell more positive? Booyah, depolarization, okay? So we'll depolarize the cell. And that's what happens here, all right, in this situation, all right? Because these hair cells are in that positively charged potassium endolymph there, all right? When the basilar membrane, okay, that's what the spiral organ sits on, when it moves up, okay, those hair cells get shoved up into the tectorial membrane there, okay? And then that causes the tips then to open up and pull on those tip links. When that happens, it opens up those channels there and it allows potassium to enter into the cell. When that happens, all right, we will then depolarize the cell. Okay. Questions? Not bad. That's kind of cool, kind of a neat idea, all right? 
<clears throat> so when the basilar membrane moves back down, it will close those channels off, all right? And then we are no longer depolarizing the cell, okay? How does the basilar membrane move back down? No more pressure waves, no more sound waves, okay? Because those sound waves were pushing on it before, right? Causes it to move upwards, all right? And, and, and no, I shouldn't say irritate, but it, it influences and distorts those hair cells so those tip links can open up the ion channels. When the sound waves stop, the membrane moves back down into, into its original position. It causes the tip links to close back down, okay? And that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so here you can see, all right, these tip links opened up, but once the basilar membrane moves, drops back down, boom, this thing will slam closed. All right, this little gate here will block off our ion channel. And we're done. And then we're no longer creating action potentials, all right, to the vestibular, to, uh, well, to the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear branch. All right, a couple of things when we're talking about sound, all right? One is pitch, okay? And that talks about the frequency, and that is basically how many of these waves occur, okay? So if it's a high-frequency sound, all right, that's going to be something like, I don't want to imitate the noise, all right? But we all know what a high-pitched noise is, all right? It's like a young child that's screaming for your name, you know, just Leave me alone, all right? But what happens is, all right, the high frequency sounds, all right, will be closer to the oval window, all right, on our cochlear duct. The low frequency sounds will be further away, near the apex there, okay? So that's, and again, good, a good fact to know about what we can perceive as humans, all right, 20 to 20,000 hertz is our normal sound wave uh, range. Someone told me dogs are up to 100,000. I don't know. I, I Google would. I don't know, but I know it's a lot. All right. Okay. But that's going to be the, the actual frequency that we can perceive, that we can hear. Okay. And all that has to do with is this concept here. All right. Sound waves, when they travel through a, a medium, air, liquid, solid, causes vibration of the molecules. That's why there's no sound in space. It's a vacuum. There's nothing out there. You want to watch an awesome movie, but at parts it could be incredibly boring. It's 2001. Speaking of which, have you guys heard about the monolith they found in Utah? Yeah. You heard about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I heard it was just hard. Yeah, I heard that too. But when I first read it, I was like, that's cool. I was like, man, I hope there's aliens out there. I want to go live with them. It's getting too crazy here. All right. Anyways. Good with that? You guys good with the frequency? Okay. I'll show you a picture here in a second to help you out. All right. And that's what this picture is showing us. Okay. So our high, frequent, our high pitch frequency is the red here. And you can see it's going to stimulate all right, the basilar membrane closer to the oval window. All right. Medium pitch frequencies are going to be further away. And then low pitch can go all as far as even going around the heliochromoma here. Right, and stimulating the far end. Okay, it's just that closer to the oval window, the basilar membrane is just more stiff. Okay, it's like a rubber band. You pluck a, a stiff rubber band, it's going to give you a higher, uh, so, a higher pitch sound. Just like with a string. Right, if it's a loose string or rubber band, it's going to be a lower. Okay, pitch. And that's what we're seeing here. All right. So that's frequency or pitch. How about loudness? Okay. This depends on the amplitude of the wave. Okay. How high and how low it goes. That's called the amplitude. Okay. So obviously, the louder something is, all right, the larger the wave amplitude will be. Okay. So that will cause more of a distortion along the basilar membrane. See, if it's a really small amplitude, we're going to barely, all right, distort much of the basilar membrane. But when it's something this big, all right, it's going to distort a lot of the basilar membrane. So we'll have louder sounds, okay? So we, we actually rate 
all right, the loudness of sounds, the, the unit called a decibel, okay? So if you have a zero decibel, that is the, the, the bare minimum or the threshold, okay? So anything over that is what we as humans can perceive, okay? So as that wave energy or that amplitude, that wave amplitude increases, all right, that will increase, all right, that decibel or that sound energy, okay? So this is a cool just a statistic here, okay? Sound energy, all right, when you increase it 10 times, that's going to be a 10 decibel increase, which is a lot. Pretty cool. All right, so, of course, we're drawing to the end of this special sense, so we have to talk about the pathway, all right? So once we actually have action potentials being generated, our nerve signal, where do they go? All right, well, obviously, they're going to travel, the, the first neuron, all right, our primary neuron is going to be the sensory neurons of the cochlear branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve, okay? So that's going to head towards, all right, our brainstem, specifically the medulla oblongata, all right? And so it's going to synapse in the cochlear nucleus. We want to know where that is, what part of the brainstem, all right, the medulla oblongata, okay? So from there... Okay, we've got a couple different options. Okay, but it's going to synapse, all right, in the, in the cochlear nucleus, all right, and then the secondary neurons, all right, are going to actually head towards the inferior. Remember the inferior colliculus? We already saw the superior colliculus, all right? The superior is for visual reflexes. Inferior colliculus is going to be for auditory reflexes, all right? Like when you call somebody's name and that person hears you and they turn towards your voice. All right, that's the inferior colliculus. That too is in the midbrain. Okay, so some of the sensory neurons can go there, and some can head towards the superior olivary nucleus. Okay, so the inferior colliculus is going to be for reflexive sounds, all right, where you turn your head, okay, when someone calls your name behind you. The superior olivary nucleus, all right, this is how you localize sounds. Okay, and also, all right, if the sound is too loud, all right, we can actually stimulate the stapedius muscle. Remember, I don't know if you remember in lab last week, the stapedius muscle, the tensor tympani muscle. The tensor tympani muscle, you have to now, all right, for lab. But both of those muscles help to dampen down loud sounds, okay? So the superior olivary nucleus will help with the contraction of those muscles, Right, especially if you go into like a loud concert, all right, and, and it gets pretty loud, it helps to deal with that. Okay, now the superior olivary nucleus can also then it can also then send neurons to the inferior colliculus. Okay, and then from these structures, from the inferior colliculus, then we go to the thalamus. And this is, remember, we talked about the lateral geniculate uh, nucleus for vision, right? When I told you we talked about the medial geniculate nucleus, right? This is the other nucleus here that's also found in the thalamus. And then, obviously, from the thalamus, we go to the primary auditory uh, cortex in the temporal lobe. Right, I'm going to show you a picture here in a second. This pathway is a little bit more complicated, but I promise you, I, don't like, I shouldn't promise you, but when you see the picture, you might have a little bit easier time. I'll come back to the slide real quick, okay? So this is what we're seeing here, okay? So sound waves are being generated, all right? Here is the cochlear branch of cranial nerve, uh, eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. All right, it travels back, synapses here, all right, into our, uh, onto the pot. Where am I? There we go, all right? It's going to synapse here onto the cochlear nucleus right, located in the pons, okay, or excuse me, the medulla oblongata. It's going to travel then, all right, to two, you have two options, okay. You can travel either to, all right, the inferior colliculus up here in the midbrain, okay, directly, or we can send some axons here to synapse onto the superior olivary nucleus. All right, in the pons there, okay? And then from there, from the superior olivary nucleus, 
all right, then we can have another neuron synapse into the inferior colliculus here in the midbrain. So this first pathway, 1, 2A, to 3, then to 4, all right, that's 1, 2, 3, well, 3, three uh, neuron chain, okay? If we go from, all right, the cochlea, all right, to the, nucle the cochlear nucleus here, right, the medulla oblongata, and then from the medulla oblongata right to the inferior colliculus in the midbrain, all right, to, did I count that right? One, two, three, four, four. Okay, all right, I'm off my brain. Sorry, guys. <laughs> all right, we have a four neuron chain, okay? We can also have here, okay, where we go from the um, cochlear nucleus here to the superior olivary nucleus, then from the superior olivary nucleus, it can synapse here onto the inferior colliculus, all right, and then from the inferior colliculus, to the thalamus, then into the primary uh, auditory. So there's a, that pathway involves an extra neuron, okay? Just keep that in mind. All right, which brings me to deafness. There's two types of deafness that, which is a hearing loss that we can have, okay? There's the conductive, and there's sensory neuro. Now, conductive deafness, okay, that's usually when you see the hearing aid on the back of somebody's ear, okay, the traditional older hearing aids, all right, that's conductive, all right, that helps to amplify the sounds, all right, so it can actually move into from the external ear to the middle ear to the inner ear, okay. Sensory neural deafness is what you've seen, the, the cochlear implants there on the side of the head there, that's what we're talking about. And in that case, now we're dealing with an issue with actual damage to the cochlear nerve, okay? When it's conductive deafness, right, we're having problems with transmission, all right, of those sound waves, all right, from the external environment, our external ear, all right, or the middle ear, and it having it move into the internal ear. So a lot of those, like elderly folks that you see, okay? those hearing aids are more for conductive deafness, right? It helps to amplify the sound waves so they can hear it better, okay? All right, last one. Equilibrium, okay? Um, I don't know if I told you guys this, but I told one of my other, my other section. I don't want you to confuse, when we're talking about the vestibular system, don't want you to confuse the vestibular system uh, equilibrium with balance, all right, because balance incorporates a lot of other things, all right, when you have balance, all right, we're including proprioception into that, all right, your, vi your visual uh, uh, apparatus is helping to contribute that, along with equilibrium, all right, equilibrium has to do with, all right, just the position of your head, okay, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail, all right, is there a fly in here? Did you see yeah. Okay, all right. I just wanted to make sure. I can't. I, yeah, I can't tell if there was something. If there, when I was turning my head, if it was like a reflection off my face shield. All right, all right. I was like, all right, I'm not losing my mind. All right. So when we're talking about equilibrium, okay, keep in mind we're always talking about something to do with the head. All right, the awareness and and the, and the monitoring of how your head is moving and where it is in relation to the rest of your body. Okay, so how we track that is through the vestibular apparatus, and there's two parts to that, okay? There's the vestibule, which is made up of the utricle and saccule, and then we have those ring-like structures. Those are the semicircular ducts, okay? So this information, along with whatever our eyes are picking up, our visual system, and along with proprioception, you remember proprioceptors, are those receptors located in your muscles, near your joints, your tendons, all right, which are giving that spatial body awareness, all right, as to where all that plays a role in balance and equilibrium, okay? So keep that in mind, okay? So when we're talking about balance, balance is like the umbrella that incorporates vision, proprioception, and equilibrium, okay? All that plays a role in balance. Simple, easy way to determine it if, if how much your balance is actually impacted, close your eyes. You know, stand up with your feet together and close your eyes. 
I guarantee you, for most of you, you'll start to sway a little bit. And that shows you that your visual system helps to keep that proper balance there. Okay, so we're going to talk about right, a couple uh, uh, items when we're dealing with equilibrium. Okay, there's three things I want to talk about. Static, e whoop, static equilibrium, right, linear acceleration, and angular acceleration. Okay, static equilibrium is when you're not moving, when your head's looking straight ahead. Okay, when we talk about linear, linear acceleration, that's when I'm looking up and down. Okay, and then finally, angular acceleration is when I'm tw turning my head. So think of linear acceleration, yes. Angular acceleration, no. That simple. Okay. So what the text, all right, static equilibrium and, and, and linear acceleration is going to be the vestibule, specifically the utricle and the saccule. And then what the text, angular acceleration are going to be those rings, the semicircular ducts. We're going to talk about that now. All right. So we'll start off with head position for static equilibrium and linear acceleration, the yes motion. All right. So the actual structure that's going to monitor that, all right, in our vestibule, it's called the macula. Okay? And it lives in our vestibule there. So this should look familiar to you because we talked about this in the lab already. Okay? But again, now we're going back to hair cells again. Okay? So in this macula, right, we're going to be dealing with hair cells and, of course, supporting cells. And on the hair cells, all right, we're going to have our stereocilla again, along with our one kinocillum, okay? In this case, instead of those hair cells projecting into the tectorial membrane, they're going to project into what we call the otolithic membrane. And in that membrane, we've got these little crystals that float around called otoliths. Coming back to this slide here, you'll see. Whoops, not there. Well, before I jump into this part, all right, so you can see where the macula is, all right, here's the vestibule, all right, the utricle and, and, the, and the saccule, all right, and so now what we're going to do is, see this little structure here, we're going to open that up, and that's here, okay, so here's the macula, which is made up of the supporting cells and the hair cells, and then on top of the hair cells, we have our stereocilla here, okay, and then at the one end, you've got the kinocilla. Okay? So these stereocilli and kinocillum are projected into the otolithic membrane. And floating around in there are these otoliths, these calcium crystals. Okay? So I know I told you guys this last time about benign positional vertebra. Okay? And that's when these otoliths are just slamming into, all right, these stereocilli to the point where it's overwhelming the patient with all this sensory information and they get dizzy, they can get nausea, they, if it gets really bad, they can vomit, they can barely move because any type of movement, that fly is killing me. <laughs> yeah, that fly is killing me. All right? But it, any type of movement, it will uh, irritate in, in, in um, the stereocilla. Yes, ma'am. The macula luta is in the eye. Yep, yep. This is just called the macula. Yeah. Where are you? <laughs> Good memory, though. Do you know where it is in the eye? You go, girl. Yeah. It surrounds the fovea centralis. Nice, 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 nice. Good. Someone's been studying. All right. So, what happens now, all right? to influence the neurological information is when our head, because when our head's not moving at all, all right, that otolithic membrane is pretty much level, okay, and the stereocilla are just chilling, all right, nothing's going on. And I think I used the example with you guys last time. It's like being on a boat with stuff that's not tied down on deck. When the boat starts to rock back and forth, stuff starts to slide on the deck back all around if it's not tied down. So that's similar to what happens here. In this case, all right, when you start to move your head all right, up towards the ceiling or down towards the floor, that otolithic membrane is going to flow where gravity is. It's, gravity is going to pull it down. All right, and that's going to distort the stereocilli and the kinocillum. Okay? And that will then um, cause 
an increase in neurotransmitter release, all right? We'll talk about that. So this concept you want to know. When we bend the stereocyli towards the kinocilum, we depolarize the hair cells, all right? When we bend the stereocyli away from the kinocilum, we hyperpolarize the hair cells, okay? So when we depolarize, we're going to increase the neurotransmitter release, okay? Specifically on the vestibular portion of cranial nerve 8, okay? So that's why I love this picture here. Not that one, not that one, this one, okay? So here you are, all right, looking straight ahead. Is it near you? You're going to kill it, kill it. <laughs> Put your mask on it and smash it. Can she do it? We got a fly, a fly in here, people at home. Did you get it? Ah, hooray! <laughs> hey, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Here. Here's, here, here's, how big Dude, is that thing? Oh my lord. Dude, I'm about to show you. No, I think it's going to be done. Do you want to use the spread? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're missing the good stuff at home, people. We're, don't worry about us. We're all safe here at home. They're not even paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> I should have turned the camera on it. We should have filmed that. Anyways, okay. So basically when we're sitting in a position where you're looking straight ahead in that static position where the head is upright. Oh, what's on my tie? Oh, it's a picture of my son when he was a baby. He was a baby. Can you see that? Yeah, he was young then. Four, three. Um, all right. Uh, so basically, all right. When you're sitting there, and as most of you probably are, if you're looking straight at your computer screen, all right, what happens is, is that the neurotransmitter is being released at a regular interval. I'm going to use an easy number. Let's just say 10. All right. The neurotransmitter is being released, and it's causing 10 action potentials a second. Okay. So when that information, when those action potentials arrive at your brain, all right, in the vestibular uh, cortex there, all right, and it says, oh, 10 action potentials a second. All right, you must be looking straight ahead. You must be in that static position. Now, when I look up towards the ceiling here, okay, as I look up towards the ceiling, okay, the otolithic membrane is going to go to wherever the gravity is, all right, and if it pushes all the stereocilla towards the one big kinocilum here, it's going to cause depolarization. When we get depolarization, more neurotransmitter gets released, and instead of having 10 action potentials a second, we get like 20, 30, okay? And so your cortex knows that when you get an increase in frequency of action potentials, then your head is looking up, okay? Now, when you look down, the otolithic membrane shifts the other way, and it shifts the stereocyli away from the kinocellum. That causes hyperpolarization, okay? And so what happens there is, since we cause hyperpolarization, we decrease the frequency. Of, well, we decrease the amount of neurotransmitter that gets released. Therefore, we decrease the frequency of action potentials. So we go from a, a regular 10, let's say a, a second, to 5 or 3. And when we get that decrease in frequency of action potentials, then your vestibular uh, cortex knows, okay, we're looking down, okay? So it all is based on the frequency of action potentials that are arriving at the vertebral, uh, uh, at the vestibular cortex. I kept saying vertebral cortex. I apologize. Vestibular cortex. So what happens if you're not sleeping? All sorts of stuff? <laughs> <laughs> well, again, if you think about it, though, when, when, when you're doing flips, and, and some, and again, Remember what we said, we have to define conscious perception of something as a sensation. And sometimes things move so, happen so fast that you might not get the whole gambit of those different positions. 
So you might catch the tail end depending on the inertia and the amount of momentum that is carrying things through because of how fast things occur. So you might, I mean, when I was in college, I used to be able to do back talks and everything, but it happened so fast. I could not tell you, you know, at any given point where my body was in relation to a lot of things. I just knew that it happened. I can only imagine what those, like, what's her name? Simone Biles, when she's doing gymnastics, all the stuff, I mean. That's a lot of, that's muscle tone and, and memory. And, and I mean, that's, that blew my mind. But yeah, it happens so fast. And again, with inertia, with everything moving, you might get certain points, but it's hard for me to believe that you know exactly what's going on every single moment. All right, let's finish up with the last portion here of angular acceleration. All right, this is when you're saying no to somebody and you're shaking your head back and forth, okay? So, in this situation, when we're talking about angular acceleration, we're going to deal with the semicircular canals, specifically the ampulla. And that's at the bottom of the semicircular canals. So I'll show you here. Where are you? There. See these little all right, swellings here? These are the ampulla of the semicircular canal. Okay. And that's where our next organ is going to be that we're going to discuss. Okay, so the ampulla has two structures of note. All right, the first one is called the crista ampullaris. All right, and this contains our hair cells and, of course, our support cells. I wish there was more exciting things I could talk about with support cells, but there's not. They just support and maintain. All right, and then also in our ampulla, we have this structure called the cupula, and the cupula. To me, it looks like a blue flame, but it's gelatin, okay? And it sits right on top of the crista ampullaris. And again, right, the hair cells have stereocilia and kinocillum that are coming off of them, right? So those stereocilia and the kinocillum are embedded into the cupula, right? I'm going to come right back. This is what it looks like, all right? So here you can see, all right, here's the crystal ampullaris. All right, it's got the support cells and then our hair cells, all right, with our stereocilia and the kinocillin coming off. All right, and then the cupula is this big blue gelatin-like structure. And then what surrounds that is endolymph. Okay, endolymph, all right, it's a fluid. Okay, so we're dealing, because, well, I'll talk about what's going to happen in a second. Okay, so around the cupula is the endolymph. Booyah! Yes, 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 yes. So when you start to shake your head, and just like with anything, I don't have anything liquidy here, otherwise I'd show it, but if I had like my water bottle and I moved it back and forth, water starts to slosh around in there. Well, that's what the endolymph does. It's gonna to start to slosh around, all right, inside the ampulla, and it's gonna smack the cupula around. And as it smacks the cupula around, all right, it's gonna cause the stereocilia and the kinocillum to bend. So in this case, all right, if those stereocilia bend toward the kinocillum, we get depolarization, okay? If they bend away, we get hyperpolarization, okay? And this will influence our neurotransmitter release, all right? And it's the same concept with the firing rate, okay? I'll show you, okay? Let me show you. I like pictures, all right? So here we're seeing the head still, dude's not doing anything. But now what happens is, as he starts to turn his head to one side, it creates that inertia, starts to move the endolymph, it starts to bang into the cupula here, all right? And then if it bangs into the cupula and it bends the cupula, all right, that will cause movement of the stereocilia, okay? And if the stereocilia move into the kinocillum, causes depolarization, We'll get an increase in the frequency, the firing rate, all right? So then your vestibular cortex realizes, all right, you were looking to the right, okay? And then if it gets to the point where you look the other way, and then the stereocilia bend away from the kinocillum, we get hyperpolarization. So we'll get a decreased release of neurotransmitter, which will cause a decrease in firing rate, decrease action potentials, and so your brain knows, hey, I'm looking to the left, okay? So again, it, it has to do with the amount of neurotransmitter that's being released. So last part, guys, 
I'm going to get a little bit beclumped here. I'm getting a little emotional. It's okay. Here we go. All right. Pathway. All right. So again, we're going to start with our sensory organ. In this situation, since we're talking about equilibrium, it's either going to be the signals come from the macula, all right, in our vestibule or the crystal ampullaris, all right, that's going to be in the um, ampulla. Okay, found in the semicircular canals. All right, regardless, all right, those signals are going to be on that primary neuron that are going to travel on the vestibular branch of the vestibular cochlear nerve. They're going to travel. This probably look, should look familiar to you because we copied this, uh, covered this in lab. All right, they're going to go to one of two places: either the vestibular nuclei, right, and the medulla oblongata, or hey, the cerebellum. Okay, cerebellum helps with proprioceptive feedback, fine tune movements, it also deals with um, uh, balance, okay? So if it goes to the vestibular nuclei, okay, all right, we're also going to see, all right, the eye and proprioception, all right, help to control some of those reflexive movements for balance and for our visual movements there for the eyes, all right? And then if we're dealing with the cerebellum, okay, our cerebellum is going to help deal with proprioceptive feedback to our skeletal muscles throughout our body, okay? So that will help with balance and overall muscle tone, okay? Perfect example. If you're standing there on two feet and I ask you to lift one foot up, okay, your cerebellum is going to increase the skeletal muscle tone in the foot that you're still standing on to help maintain that balance along with proprioceptive feedback, okay? All right, and then from there, all right, whether depending on where all right, those nuclei, uh, those axons went to, all right, either the vestibular nuclei or the cerebellum, it's going to send information to the thalamus. And then obviously from the thalamus, then we go back to the cerebral cortex. Okay, so here comes this picture. All right, the one overlap. Here's the primary neuron coming from the vestibular apparatus going to either the vestibular nucleus here in the medulla or going to the cerebellum, okay? Then from there, okay, the cerebellum and the, vest and the vestibular nucleus, all right, can send out, all right, information to your eyes, because remember, your, your visual system helps with balance too, okay? Because depending on where you're looking, okay? But then from, the cerebellum or the vestibular nuclei, all right, our secondary neurons then will transmit up towards the thalamus and then from the thalamus to the cerebral cortex for the vestibular system. Okay, just kind of be familiar with that. Take a peek, keep an eye out. And if you notice, these cranial nerves here, oculomotor, trochlear, and abducens, all three of those control all of the extrinsic eye muscles. Okay. Specifically, all right, um, cranial nerve four, all right, is going to do lateral rectus. No, no, excuse me, uh, superior oblique. And then cranial nerve six does uh, lateral rectus. And then your ocular motor nerve does all the rest. Remember that equation I gave you guys? SO4. That's supposed to be no. SO4, LR, six over three. You guys remember that? Oh no! <laughs> You're looking at me like I never saw that. I think I briefly put it up there. Maybe I didn't. Superior oblique is cranial nerve four. Lateral rectus is cranial nerve six. All the other muscles, extrinsic eye muscles, that includes medial rectus, inferior rectus, superior rectus, inferior oblique, um, are going to be controlled by cranial oculomotor, cranial nerve. <laughs> no, no, no. That comes later. See what you get if you have me in 2.11? Your minds are going to be blown. Like, what is he talking about now? All right, well, that concludes all the new material, and we have time to spare. Um, so um, let's take a quick break.